A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the master's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried, and from the netherworld, where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you receive what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. The rich man said then, then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that they may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, Oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Would you please pay attention? That's the title of this homily today. Would you please pay attention? Somebody sent me an email just this past week, and it was a picture of a sign taken at a a local restaurant, and the sign said, we do not have Wi-Fi here. Talk to each other. Pretend it's 1995. Would you please pay attention? The problem of the rich man, the unnamed rich man, is simply that he didn't pay any attention to Lazarus, and maybe not other people as well. The rich man's sin is one word. It's not that he kicked the guy or you know, cursed at him or as I said, you know, called the police or anything. The rich man's sin is simply one horrible human word. Indifference. It's a word that actually Pope Francis speaks about a lot. The worldwide, the global sin of indifference. That's it. That's all. That's everything. That's enough. So, you know, they say that charity begins at home. And sometimes that's also where it ends. 
for folks who draw this circle of responsibility with a very short radius. Some people terminate uh, the locus of concern with the nuclear family, so not my family, not my problem. Others may extend it briefly to include other relatives and close personal friends. For those with a cultivated sense of community, generosity might be extended to the neighborhood, to the, to the parish, to the village, to the town. But however we define who belongs to us and who we want to pay attention to, it's clear that most of us perceive some boundary, some boundary beyond which our consideration for largesse, for generosity, for attention, isn't necessarily required. And so, in this regard, the rich man at his sumptuous dinner didn't owe poor Lazarus a thing. He didn't do anything to cause his poverty, his predicament, his situation. Didn't cause it. But he didn't do anything to do anything about it. And by Jewish law, it was Lazarus's own relatives who should have been seeing to the needs of this misfortunate individual. So, you know, Lazarus was like that homeless person rattling the styrofoam cup for our spare change. And, and we can tend to think, aren't there agencies out there that's supposed to care for that person? I've been in that situation many times, been thinking I should do something, but pass by. Or it could be like that bloated child in magazine photos. And we can think to ourselves, their own government should do better by her, not ours, not us, not me. Or those refugees streaming across all over the world, not just here, but all over the world. They may well be victims of bad politics or warfare or economic mismanagement or bigotry, maybe all of the above. But how does any of that imply that their situation, their plight, is ours to solve. Most of us find ways to distance ourselves, to wash our hands, and not to pay any or much attention to the struggles that lies beyond our realm or our perceived responsibility. For all of us, it's a challenge. And the rich man in the story is no different. He, his lovely suppers, were never disturbed by the thought of this sore, infested Lazarus right at his door. A young man who heard uh, this homily yesterday at the end of the Mass said, he said that, you know, maybe the rich man is like many folks these days who take videos on their phone of very bad situations, people getting beat up or robbed or whatever it might be, taking videos, but they never stopped to help. They forwarded to somebody else, or to the news. In any case, the rich man's radius of responsibility was perhaps uh, much shorter than yours and mine. We're a little more attentive, hopefully. But abbreviated compassion is only a matter of degree. All too soon, the rich man will learn, to his dismay, that Father Abraham, that God, is Lazarus's father too. So the question might be, how far is our love and compassion obliging us to go? A question that we all have to answer in our hearts in different ways, in different situations, wherever we find ourselves. If God's expectations are the ones that concern us, then the answer is quite far indeed. Because, you know, someone once asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And the response wasn't comforting. The direct answer of Jesus, essentially, everyone. Now we can't care for everyone in the world, but we can care for 
the people we happen to interact with, people in our family that we might ignore, whoever it might be. And so in so many parts of the gospel, Jesus keeps saying to us in different ways, would you please pay attention? Mother Teresa was once asked after being, uh, uh, somebody, a man asked her from Brooklyn, he said to her, I want to come to Calcutta and volunteer my service to help. Very generous offer. And her response to this man from Brooklyn was four words. Find your own Calcutta. Find your own Calcutta. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us together to find our own Calcutta. And no doubt, our personal Calcutta won't involve an airfare somewhere, but something will be so much nearer, closer by than we could ever have imagined. A few years ago, Mark Zuckerberg pledged $3 billion to prevent diseases. Maybe part of that inspiration for that generous donation came from his meeting with Pope Francis just a few weeks before making that pledge. Wherever the inspiration came from, he was, at that moment, finding his own Calcutta and paying attention to a particular global need. But as I reflected upon Zuckerberg's extraordinary gesture of a very rich man paying attention to many Lazaruses in the world, what Zuckerberg is most famous for is obviously, namely, Facebook. That hasn't always help people to pay attention. Zuckerberg's largesse made me think that there are really two types of Lazaruses out there in the world. Number one, those whom we may not or do not have a direct relationship with or a direct responsibility for, like the poor, like the refugees, like, you know, so many suffering in the Ukraine and so on and so forth. And secondly, those who we do know, perhaps quite well, but may not really be paying much attention to either. The second type of Lazarus can be exemplified by Facebook. Um, uh, uh, Father Zach and I uh, are not on Facebook, I don't know much about it, but I do know that it is a great technological innovation. Uh, yesterday when I was writing this homily, I checked and the number of people on Facebook, enrolled in Facebook, is 2.85 billion. So maybe his donation was one, almost one dollar for each person. But it enables users to maintain contact with thousands of friends and acquaintances at any moment. And they say that half of those 2.85 billion are log on to the site every day. But a recent study points out that young Facebookers are starting to discover the limits of cyber relationships. It's a gift to be able to communicate with people all across the globe by friending people uh, worldwide. And certainly in our frenetic and work-obsessed culture, especially post-COVID, Facebook reminds us that social networks, that communication, that communion matters. But researchers are also concluding that Facebook friends and social networking aren't adequate substitutes for authentic relationships. We still need to pay attention to relationships with others. And that's why, that's why we don't just you know, watch Mass at home on TV, but we come to church. That's why we come to be engaged with one another. Even if we don't know everybody, we're here together to be on this mission to find Jesus in one another. Young people can love the high-tech world of multitasking and interactive media and all sorts of things like that. Um, but there's also that need for personal intimacy and face-to-face -face conversation that the world is very much lacking now and obviously was lacking in the situation of the rich man and Lazarus. So the reality is that we might have multiple social networks out there and thousands of online friends and things like that and still find ourselves profoundly lonely 
just like Lazarus in this gospel. And so the challenge for us is, you know, we're created by God for relationships and we long for support and encouragement from those we know well. And people, you know, aren't as likely to turn to Facebook when a loved one is dying or for guidance and vocational discernment or for the joys and the warmth of, you know, physical relationship. So just as the rich man's wealth in this parable made him oblivious to the plight of Lazarus at his gate, at his door, we can sometimes shut ourselves up in our own virtual world, preferring the safe distance of, you know, Facebook or some uh, e-relationship and other distractions to avoid the more demanding and the yet more fulfilling encounters with the various Lazaruses at the gate. Did you notice in this parable that the fate of the five brothers left behind from the rich man, that their fate is left untold in the story? That's because it's unfinished, as many of Jesus' parables were unfinished. We don't know whether the, you know, the, the oldest son went into the party for the prodigal son. So we are now the five brothers, metaphorically, as a family, as a community, as a parish family. How all of this ends is up to us and how attentive we are to the many invitations of grace that life, that God plays right at our doorsteps to the Lazaruses that surround us all. So the question that Jesus asked 2,000 years ago and today is the same. Would you please pay attention? And would you please find your own Calcutta?